Hello, I'm Amanda Moore. I'm the director of the Clearinghouse Community. Welcome to the Advocacy Exchange for January 2018. The Advocacy Exchange is our monthly conversation with advocates advancing change. Both the Advocacy Exchange and the Clearinghouse Community are brought to you by the Sergeant Shriver National Center on Poverty Law, a national leader in advancing justice and opportunity. And today I'm joined by three extraordinary guests. I'm so excited to talk with them. Uh, first, we have Professor Peter Edelman of Georgetown Law, where he is the faculty director of the Center on Poverty and Inequality. And Professor Edelman has also written a new book, Not a Crime to be Poor, The Criminalization of Poverty in America. And this is gonna be the launch point for our conversation today. He joins us from Washington, DC. Thank you for being here, Professor Edelman. My pleasure, thank you. Next, we have Nusrat Chaudhary. Nusrat is a senior staff attorney with the ACLU's Racial Justice Program. She's also one of the attorneys whose work is highlighted in Professor Edelman's book, and she joins us today from New York City. Hi, Nusrat. Hi, and thank you so much for having me. And last but not least is John Bowman. John is the president of the Sergeant Shriver National Center on Poverty Law, and he's written a review of Professor Edelman's book, and he joins us today from Chicago. Hi, John. Hello, great to be with you. So John's book review makes a, a really interesting connection between the original goals of the war on poverty and civil rights legislation and contrasts it with these laws that have basically made it a crime to be poor. Um, his review is available to read on the Clearinghouse community. You can find it at the address on my screen, povertylaw.org slash clearinghouse. So I know we have a lot of new viewers this month. I welcome you all, um, and we'd like to hear from you. So I'll tell you how you can submit your questions to my guests. Um, we would love to hear from you. So if you're watching through the Shriver Center's YouTube channel, you notice there's a box there that says live chat. I see some of you have found it and are already saying hello. Um, if you'd like to say hello, just send us your name and where you're watching. And as we talk, feel free to send your questions. If live chat is not your thing, you can also email me. I'll keep an eye on my email while we're talking. My address is Amanda Moore, M-O-O-R-E, at povertylaw.org. Now, everyone who registered for today's program will receive an email early next week that will have a link to a recording of today's conversation, along with a link to John Bowman's review <coughs> and a link to register for next month's advocacy exchange. So I want to uh, begin by saying hello to a couple of people who've said hello. We have Dorinda in Minneapolis and Samantha in Washington State. Hello, thanks for joining. Before we really jump into this, I wanna make sure that we all have um, an understanding of what we're talking about when we talk about how poverty has been criminalized. So Professor Edelman, can you tell us what you mean when you say that we as a country have made it a crime to be poor? But of course, uh, we've had m mass incarceration uh, for a long time, and, and that's uh, certainly a criminalization of poverty uh, right there, uh, both in terms of people who are poor uh, being arrested and incarcerated, and then how they're stuck with collateral consequences. But that's not what we're talking about here, or we can say that, that it's a, a kind of a e uh, evil sibling. Uh, there, there, there are a couple things here. One, uh, the obvious uh, is fines and uh, fees and uh, also money bail related to that as well as being a, a problem uh, of its own. Uh, and uh, that's some of it. Uh, we know what that is. Uh, people get <coughs> thrown in uh, one way or another on, on uh, usually very small things and then they get stuck because they owe money and, and it piles up. But what I've done with the book and what I think is, is the, uh, important to understand is that the criminalization of poverty uh, is not uh, only about that. Uh, it, uh, th there's a relationship, uh, particularly around uh, what we've asked to, to, uh, police to do in our, in our country. And so uh, we see kids uh, who not only being suspended or uh, expelled in, in school, but for uh, playground fights and minor things get sent to court. And it's, it's, all, it's really all over the country. And, and uh, indeed, when kids uh, are set, sent to, uh, to the juvenile courts, not only uh, does it uh, end up with collateral consequences, but uh, now in state after state, the, the, the parents have to pay uh, for, for uh, 
anything that happens there, whether it's diversion or, or on up. So there's that. Uh, there is the horrible fact of uh, chronic uh, nuisance uh, ordinances, uh, which uh, the, the Shriver Center is working on uh, a lot, and so is ACLU, uh, where uh, particularly women who uh, call on uh, 911 uh, because of uh, domestic violence and, and are told under the local law that they can only make three calls uh, or so uh, and if they if they uh, call more than that, the police have the power to tell the the uh, landlord uh, to e evict the person, and we see that uh, too much around the country. And indeed, the only reason we know specifically these things is when there is a lawyer, and that's so important that there be lawyers for people. And then things that also that we know in terms of the way we've criminalized homelessness and. Uh, really uh, kick them out of the city by, by uh, vagrancy and other other kinds of, of, of prosecutions. Uh, we we find uh, again with uh, with these ordinances that they use them to kick people out of neighborhoods where African Americans have have uh, uh, moved into uh, white neighborhoods and and the police uh, again cause the person to be evicted. Uh, so it's it's a long uh, list of things, public benefits, where people are, in fact, uh, criminalized uh, when there's some uh, phony uh, claim of, of, of fraud. And I think it's important to understand this is a national problem, uh, and it is not just about fines and fees, but a much broader uh, kind of, of uh, serious concerns. Thank you. Uh, John, I want to turn to you. So your, the book review that you wrote, um, contrast the goals of the war on poverty with this set of laws that um, Professor Edelman has just described. And you particularly focus on race. And I wonder if you could elaborate on that for us. Well, it, it's, one of the, it's one of the most salient features of poverty in America uh, to this day. Um, in, in Johnson's uh, speech, President Johnson's speech, when he announced the, the war on poverty, he also announced the intent to pass civil rights laws and he uh, he linked those two, and he properly linked those two, uh, that there uh, you, you can't really do a, uh, an honest job of uh, addressing one without also addressing the other one. Um, po uh, poverty fell from you know twenty two percent or so in the late fifties to eleven in the early seventies, so the programs were effective. But here we are, you know, fifty years later. Uh, Poverty settled in around 13 to 15 percent. Thank goodness for the war on poverty programs, or it would be at least twice as bad as that. Uh, but but we but it remains stubborn, and it remains you know you're three times more likely to be poor if you're African American. You're two times more likely to be poor if you're Hispanic, and you know so what explains that? And that's one of the big uh, I think one of the services that uh, Professor Edelman's done with his book here, um, and is to, uh, because it goes a long way towards explaining uh, what's going on. What is it that keeps pe makes people poor and keeps them poor? And then unmistakably uh, shows that it is heavily about race. Uh, and uh, so it, the, the book summarizes uh, all of these different things that Peter was just talking about, but it also lumps them under a heading and an accurate heading of the criminalization of poverty uh, and the uh, um, continuing racial imbalance in the experience of poverty in this country. Uh, the other great uh, thing that happens in the book and, uh, is, and it's a great recipe for everybody out there, particularly on this call, is that throughout the book, he highlights successful efforts to combat these things. Um, and so it's a, it's a wonderful sort of list of uh, strategies, uh, tactics, programs, uh, attitudes of public officials uh, that can help to address these things. Yes, that's right. Um, and we'll turn next to Nusrat, who is one of the people uh, mentioned in the book. So um, a couple of cases that you've worked on are highlighted in the book. One of those took place in Georgia and it involved a private probation company. Can you tell us a little bit about what was going on there and what the lawyers were able to do to put a stop to it? Absolutely. I, I think what's so wonderful about this book is that it shows how the criminalization of poverty is 
contrary to really core American values of fairness and equal protection of the law, which we all, as, as people who live in this country, want to see our justice system live up to. And what Professor Edelman does is he really kind of pulls out the story of Kevin Thompson in a way that humanizes this problem. It gives it a face, a story, and a life. And it's really important to give a kind of honor those real life experiences, which I think the book does so well. So Kevin Thompson was a teenager who was given a ticket for driving on a suspended license. That original suspension itself was faulty, but but, you know, we'll leave that those details for the book itself. But what happened was a judge ordered him to pay $800 in 30 days. And that was all he was sentenced to. He didn't have the money as a teenager. So the judge put him under the supervision of a for-profit company called Judicial Correction Services. And JCS is part of a trend we've seen that has fed into the criminalization of poverty across the country. The outsourcing of public justice to for-profit companies that only make money off of the people who are involved in the system itself. So what we saw in Kevin's case was he was ordered to purport every week and make payments on that $810 fine. JCS tacked on their own fine. And as a teenager, without a license, Kevin couldn't earn money. He was actually training to be a truck driver, um, a tow truck driver, and that was gonna provide him a livelihood, but he couldn't do that without a license. So he nevertheless really kind of heroically struggled to raise money to pay his fines and fees. He raked leaves, he did odd jobs, but still was only able to come up with about $85. The company told him, you didn't pay the money, you have to go to court and you're probably gonna be jailed and uh, demanded that he pay $150 for a public defender. Kevin didn't know what that was. And he asked the probation officer, you know, what's a public defender? The answer he got was a lawyer who you have to pay to talk for you in court. And so Kevin, a person who couldn't pay the fine in the first place, um, who, you know, of the $85 he paid had mostly gone to the probation company fee, you know, he thought, well, I can't afford $150. I don't want a lawyer. So he just didn't even invoke his right because he was misinformed by a private company officer who had these incentives to raise money for the company rather than helping the court identify someone who was a teenager working really hard and simply couldn't pay. And when Kevin did go to court, you know, he dressed in clothes he had borrowed from his dad. He wore a dress shirt, he wore a tie, went with his mother, and he asked the court for community service, for an extension of time, for help uh, getting a temporary driver's license so that he could resume his work training to be a tow truck driver. In minutes, the judge just didn't want to hear it, sentenced him to jail, and he was taken away in handcuffs in front of his mom. And this was his first interaction with the justice system. He started to cry. Um, and he explained to us that being in jail for those five days was the hardest five days of his life. And he felt like he had tried so hard, but he was shown no fairness and, and no chance to hear uh, to be heard. What the ACLU did was brought a lawsuit against the DeKalb County Recorder's Court and the county itself for raising money using this for-profit probation company from some of its poorest residents who couldn't pay fines and fees. That lawsuit was actually settled within six weeks, resulted in transformative reforms in that jurisdiction. It actually ultimately supported legislation that led to the abolishment of that court, which really had been generating revenue for the county rather than administering justice. So it's an example of how one individual person standing up and saying, what you did to me does not comport with the constitution. It is not fair. It does not provide equal protection under the law and things need to change can actually have a tremendous impact on how the justice system works in this country. Thank you, that's such a compelling story. Um, we've had a few people say hello. We have uh, Kate in Savannah. Colleen in San Francisco. We also have Robert in Columbus, Ohio, who had commented already about the privatization of prisons and how poverty is producing customers for some of these corporations. Um, so thanks for that, Robert. Uh, I'd like to turn back to you, Professor Edelman, 
as we've talked about so much already is the, the thing that I really liked about your book was how it focused on these actual advocates and attorneys and community leaders who are working to dismantle this racist system and build something better in its place. Um, and as your introduction pointed out, there are so many pieces to this. And I'm wondering, as you were putting the book together, how you decided to define the scope and how you found the people that and the cases and the advocacy work that you profiled in the book. Well, as to the first, uh, the first thing w was, why did I do the book uh, at all? And that uh, comes down to Ferguson, Nusrat, and, and colleagues uh, around the country who had been doing this litigation before uh, what the problems were. But it wasn't widely known. There was some journalists and so on. But I woke up to it anyway, speaking for myself, uh, when Ferguson took place and, and it kind of came together to me that it wasn't only in Ferguson. And so that drew me into it, that it, that was a national and is a national problem. Amazing. And part of the, we've talked about the driver's license suspensions yet, which is really almost every every state in the country is the is the overall for the majority way of harassing women, uh, people and, and taking uh, taking their money and just making it terrible. Uh, but then uh, just thinking about it uh, and, 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 and talking to people, uh, I, be, I came to realize that there are all these other things that I talked about before uh, because it's really uh, even bigger than, than the fines and fees uh, and, and the money bail. So then I started talking to people. And, and of course, uh, some of this is I've been on the earth for a while. I, I know John Bowman uh, and et cetera. Uh, and so John told me a lot of things. Uh, but but seriously, I would uh, somebody tells me to talk to Sarah uh, Garrity uh, at the Southern uh, Human Rights Center, and uh, in turn that somewhere along there that that gets me to not very far down the line uh, to, to find Nusrat, uh, Sam Brook uh, at the Southern Poverty Law Center, and then people I know, Danny Engelberg down in uh, Orleans, uh, Defender in in, Saint, in New Orleans. Uh, and so one thing leads to another. Uh, so some of it's my own networks, and it's easily uh, you you call uh, any of those wonderful people, and they tell you about five more. So that wasn't hard at all. Excellent, thank you. Um, well, John, as we talk about how multifaceted this problem is, I'm I'm thinking of you as someone who, you know, your job is to think strategically about how to tackle these problems. How do you do that when a problem has so many different horrible pieces coming at you at once? Well, one of the uh, one of the most uh, important things about Peter's book is that he's got uh, ample examples in there, like Nusrat's work, uh, of successful strategies, litigation, legislation, uh, media strategies, uh, public officials who have recognized the problem and dealt with it. Um, you know, a uh, school superintendent in Texas who stopped using police officers uh, and actually improved his graduation rates in his test scores. Um, the uh, so there's 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 powerful examples in the book of things to do, and I think what can be done is um, that um, which has always been the the power of of the clearinghouse community going back fifty years now is that people see what each other. Uh, uh, what each other has ha, have accomplished and copy it, right? I mean, I think we need more of uh, the examples that are in the book, right? So uh, Newsrat's been in, in, engaged in two successful pieces of litigation. Um, I think that there's probably dozens of places around the country that are, uh, you know, are begging for the same treatment. So we have to um, work with our community partners so that the stories emerge, the powerful story of Mr. Thompson in, in Georgia was what drove that whole effort. Uh, we all have these connections in the communities we serve, and there's a, a menu of strategies here that have been successful or show promise, uh, and uh, you know, to get to work on this thing. It's one of the most important fronts, I think, in uh, this intersection between poverty and race. Um, that, that where we can engage and where we've seen um, 
uh, that that success is there to be had uh, if we if we take it on. Thank you. I want to uh, remind our viewers that we would love to hear from you. If you have a question for one of my guests, uh, please share it with us. You can do that through the live chat on YouTube, or you can email me at the address on the screen, Amanda Moore, M-O-O-R-E, at povertylaw.org. Nusrat, I'll turn back to you now. So John's talking about how we need to be connected, um, how we need these examples. What um, if people are interested, if they're listening, they're watching, and they think this is something I see and I want to do something about it, what can they actually do? There is so much they can do, and especially this community that's uh, linked into the Shriver Center. You know, many of you are legal services attorneys. Some of you work in social justice, whether you're in direct service or in some kind of policy or impact work. You know, one thing I encourage everyone to do is if you work with poor communities, if you're working with communities, find out if they're having trouble paying fines and fees and are suffering from collateral consequences as a result. That kind of on the ground knowledge leads to so much change. It leads to impact litigation. It leads to really effective direct advocacy on behalf of individual clients, whether in criminal cases or civil cases. It can also inform policy reform. Mm -hmm. And just to give some examples, you know, the ACLU has done trainings for the National Association of Public Defenders and the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, because we think individual attorneys in their cases can actually implement a lot of what we're trying to secure through these civil rights actions that are trying to get lawyers in the room, trying to get ability to pay hearings so that there aren't warrants or kind of minutes long probation revocation hearings where people like Kevin Thompson are being revoked and jailed. Um, there's a lot that can be done. We have tons of resources on our website and you can even get in touch with me and I'd be happy to point you in the right direction. I think also as you see injustices in your local courts or if you're a social worker with your clients, you know, explaining to you that they have a suspended driver's license or they owe court fines they can't pay, you can cook up with the ACLU and with the, the numerous advocacy organizations identified in Peter's book, the Southern Poverty Law Center, the Southern Center for Human Rights, ACLU affiliates across the country. All of us want to hear from you because what you are seeing will observe how we work on these issues in your state. And we can talk to you about whether impact litigation is a possibility and in the mix in your state. That litigation can be a little tricky because there are some hoops that you have to get through to get into court, whether it's state court or federal court, and it's a very jurisdiction-specific call as to whether civil rights impact litigation makes sense. But in every jurisdiction, advocating for individual clients makes sense in court. In every jurisdiction, um, there are policy reforms that are being floated, whether it's in the legislature or with court leaders, to make sure that they're abiding by constitutional principles principles that exist today and that should be implemented in these cases. And I'll just note one more thing that all of you can do. You know, we are advocating with the American Bar Association to get a set a, a set of 10 guiding principles on court fines and fees, similar to what already exists in the indigent defense context. You know, and if this is passed in August, this is a document that any person can take to a court to say, look, the way that you're running this isn't doesn't work and it's against the best practices and standards of the professional associations involving lawyers and judges and prosecutors and defense attorneys and those kinds of tools already do exist so we encourage all of you to become policy advocates in your individual jurisdictions thank you those are some wonderful tips and i believe i heard in there that you said people could get in touch with you absolutely afterwards. so you can you can email me my email is and like Nancy, C-H-O-U, D like David, H-U-R-Y at ACLU.org. Excellent. And we'll be sure to include that on the follow-up email that goes out early next week. We'll put your contact information in there so people can um, get in touch with you pretty easily. Uh, Professor Edelman, as you were interviewing all these people across the country, I'm wondering if you saw common threads through the stories that they told, the way they approached their work, um, the things that were driving them. Uh, yes, uh, the problems, uh, of course, uh, the, there's a, one kind of a contest among the horrible judges uh, who seem to uh, do the same thing, whether it's in South Carolina or Benton County, uh, Washington, uh, all over the country. 
uh, instead of really talking about the ability to pay, uh, they look at somebody's shoes and say, you've got nice uh, shoes there, and so you must be able to pay, uh, or you have a tattoo. Uh, so there are things that, that uh, are uh, <laughs> somehow, I don't know, maybe maybe they have a communication system to, so that the judges all know to say those nasty things. Um, and you see uh, over and over again um, the way in which these uh, driver's licenses uh, are taken away and people uh, then, then have to drive and, and then they get arrested again and the, it mounts up. That, that uh, is very similar uh, across uh, the country. So on, on the problem side, and, and these things that mount up without, however it started, whether it was related to, to driving or not, it might be just being... Uh, 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 arrested for mowing, not mowing the uh, lawn. Uh, and then uh, in terms of uh, what uh, uh, we, we just heard, uh, just what I just said, uh, what one sees and the more communication we can get among, among the lawyers and the journalists uh, and the public officials and and understand what they've done in uh, in California with Prop 47 and decarceration and, and getting that to move uh, around the country and doing it other places. Uh, and of course, the the uh, uh, what what the National Poverty Law Center, that's our, the uh, Shriver Center, uh, does is exactly that in terms of of uh, building the relationships, the networks, and people learning from one another. So I saw that. Uh, it's real and we need to do much more of it. Thank you. So for our last question, I want to give each of you a chance to answer it. And it's a pretty simple question, probably not a simple answer, but the question is what's next? So obviously we've made some progress, um, we're chipping away at it, but have a long way to go. So John, I'd like to start with you. What's next? Um, the, you know, one, going back to Peter's last uh, statement, um, one of the commonalities, is that in many of the circumstances here that are in the book and elsewhere, uh, that it, you, you understand that this is an artifact of the tax cutting ideology, where the politicians tell the public, uh, you can pay lower taxes, but we'll continue vital services. And yet, in fact, they have to defund the local police and courts, who then have to find a way to pay their own salaries through these fines and fees. Um, so we're about to have another big fight on the federal level, uh, massive uh, proposals to cut vital programs for people in poverty uh, and that the, the things that make opportunity possible, like health insurance. Um, and so we, we need to remember that uh, the, 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 the way to do responsible public policy is to pay for it adequately. Um, and then I guess the other thing I'd say is the next step is what I said before. Uh, there's plenty of examples here. Um, we need to work with our, our communities that we serve and uh, move forward on attacking these systems of uh, uh, oppression. Thank you. <clears throat> this right. what's next? Well, I think what's next is more litigation and also translating those wins, as I said before, into individual cases so that public defenders, legal services attorneys, and social workers become part of this movement for change. If we can change how each case is handled in court, we can move this issue exponentially. Um, the impact litigation will continue because unfortunately what we've seen is even as consciousness has raised since the events in Ferguson exposed a debtor's prison and municipal revenue generation scheme that preyed on poor people of color, we still find examples throughout the country. Uh, so I don't see a shortage of any impact litigation advocacy at that level. And then finally, I do see a move towards translating these wins in courts to statewide change, state level of legislation state judges uh, making system change for their courts in their states so that we're not just changing individual courts and counties, but we're actually looking at entire statewide reform. Thank you. And to your point about more litigation coming, we just got a question in from Susan in Arkansas with a specific question. So Susan, what I'll do since our time is drawing to a close is I'll put you in touch with Newsrot after um, the broadcast um, and you all can talk causes of action because that's what she's asking about. Um, Professor Edelman, you wrote the book. I'll give you the last word. What's next? 
Thank you, thank, thank you, thank you. Uh, one thing I, I would say uh, in in the near future, and it's already happening, is uh, the uh, sessions of Trump's uh, Department of Justice, uh, which has gone in the wrong direction, and all of these things. There was a great help from from the uh, the Obama uh, DOJ, uh, and and that's gone. And uh, the what next is for everybody? These things. Uh, do uh, are significantly at the state and local level anyway, although the feds make a difference. So uh, people all over the country uh, just need to double the effort and, and keep going. The momentum is there. We should understand that this is moving in the right direction and, and uh, we can very much make progress uh, even with Mr. Session there. Uh, and the other thing is we really need a movement. Now we need that for the country about everything. Uh, but uh, we've seen on, on mass incarceration itself uh, that w we really have gotten public support, and, and you can see the difference, uh, however slow it is. It's, that's moving in the right direction. We haven't quite got the same uh, public uh, understanding of how uh, t terrible uh, the fines and fees and, and all of the criminalization that, that we talked about here, and we just need the public to understand better, and that's that's a challenge uh, directly to people who write and the, the, the uh, journalists and so on, but in every way we can to get the understanding of this, of people uh, who are not the lawyers, but but the people uh, uh, who create the, the political push uh, for change. Thank you. Thanks to all three of you. And I want to remind all our viewers to read Professor Edelman's book, Not a Crime to be Poor, and also check out John Bowman's review of it, Poverty and People of Color, Some Answers to Why, which you can find at povertylaw.org slash clearinghouse. If you enjoyed today's program, please join our mailing list so you're notified of future events and articles that we've published. You can sign up at connect.povertylaw.org slash clearinghouse. And I'll remind you that the Advocacy Exchange is now available as a podcast. You can subscribe to the Advocacy Exchange on Apple Podcasts or wherever you subscribe to podcasts. And I'd like to invite you to join us for next month's advocacy exchange. It's called How to Defend Low-Wage Workers Against Non-Compete Agreements. My guest will be Carol Brook, a senior staff attorney with the Workers' Rights Project at the North Carolina Justice Center. And we'll talk about how non-compete agreements um, which limit where an employee can work after leaving a job have spread into the low wage sector. She's got some good ideas about how to challenge those. That will take place on Thursday, February 15th, same time as today, uh, one o'clock Eastern, 10 o'clock Pacific. You'll find the link to register for that in the follow-up email that you get early next week. So we hope that you will join us next month. And in the meantime, remember that you're not alone out there. Thank you.